Um, Professor Hacker was so kind to write me some notes about what he's going to speak this evening. Um, he entitled his lecture, Possessions of Books, Fashioning Identity and Cultural Transmission, the Hebrew Collection of Salman Shokin. And he would like, he's going to introduce us to the how Shokin became a bibliophile, um, what his passion for books is about, and his personal and ideological impetus of these. And here actually was very curious also what you read, wrote later on. He will also relate to the transfer of the books to Jerusalem and the salvage of rare book, rare book prints. And um, maybe this is a question for discussion afterwards or tomorrow, actually how this, his motivation to collect books and to save books might have changed during the 30s. And if here one maybe also needs to add um, a motivation of responsibility and possibilities. So please, you're welcome. Thank you. And good evening. I am sure that there are here people who know the collection and the history much better than myself. Some of you uh, certainly are more familiar with Zalman Shokin and his personality and deeds than me. What I intend to do is to place his Hebrew collection in the context of collecting cultural heritage and humanist ideals, while shortly outline the collection and its importance from a standpoint of historian of culture and a historian of the book. I thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to perform this task. I would like to point out that I extensively relied on the master thesis of Ms. Silka Schaeffer on the Hebrew collection of Salman Shokin, written at the Hebrew University in 1995. Uh, in, in my description of the development of the, of the collection. Now let's get to the talk itself. Collecting became an activity of choice among the social and educated elite already in the early modern period. Through the possession of objects, especially books, collectors physically acquired knowledge, and by their display, they acquired the honor and the reputation that men were yearning for. Many European people envisioned collecting as a key to understanding their world and its culture. They were promoters and keepers of culture. Through their activity, they complemented the knowledge and the understanding of the world and stretched the parameters of the known. Seeing and understanding the world through a literary canon gave the collector a common framework that he shared with others who, like him, cherished the same humanist outlook. It also separated him from the rest of society. The collectors were drawn to the intellectual and ethical norms of a culture which they contributed to perpetuate. They looked for famous men who constituted ideal images from the past and made exemplary achievements in their literary output and their thought. Many collectors were dri driven by encyclopedic curiosity, others by social and political ambitions. Their deeds showed a commitment to study and to culture and a shrewd <laughs> engagement with humanistic ideals. They preferred the role of brokers to personal advancement. But collecting had also to do with constituting an identity. The world of learning provided the collector with tools to form his identity beside his family, profession, and religious affiliation. As the saying of Erasmus, Men are not born, 
but fashioned. While authors display themselves through their writings, collectors did it through their collections. The books of the collector shaped his image and positioned him within the humanist tradition. His choice of books, in many cases, highlighted the self-referential aspect of his activity. The collector achieved recognition as a tie between the world of learning and the world of power and business. He was perceived as a person who valued all forms of excellence, and his collection was a mirror of his own virtue. He invented himself. Collectors frequently invited strangers to see the collection, and networks of friendship were created with people who had passion for books and other cultural objects, especially patricians, scholars, intellectuals, and educated elites. There were permanent guests but also occasional visitors. All enjoyed the beauty of books, the rarity of manuscripts, and the magnificence of the bindings, and even special copies printed on parchment and colored paper. Books, unlike other collectible items, had intrinsic characteristics, high craftsmanship, special formats, material, quality of paper and print, beside their content. But as John Carter wrote in his book, Taste and Technique in Book Collecting, London, 1970, one of the collector's most significant functions was to anticipate the scholar and the historian to find some interest where none was recognized before, to rescue books from obscurity, to pioneer a subject or an author by seeking out and assembling the raw material for study in whatever its printed form. Rewards were great, a promise of fame and association with the cultural elite." End of quote. Formerly, private collections of books were small. But even before the invention of block printing, several hundreds of books were no exception. But by the end of the 16th century, individual collections in Italy, for example, contained already 10 to 13,000 volumes. No wonder that the process towards the institutionalization of private collections in public museums and libraries occurred in that period. Unfortunately, little is known on Hebrew book collecting in ancient times and the Middle Ages. Only from the late Middle Ages and further, we possess sufficient data on private Hebrew book collections. According to my research on such collections owned by Jews in Aragon and Catalonia in the 14th and 15th centuries, the average number of manuscripts in such a collection was 28, quite a high number in those times. Out of 114 lists that I examined, only four exceeded 
100 volumes. Basically, the same is true for Italian Jewry in the same period. But things changed dramatically after the invention and the spread of the block printing industry. From that period until the 20th century, some enthusiastic collectors accumulated huge collections. Let us mention a very few. For example, the Da Pisa family, Abraham Garziano of Modena, Joseph Salomon del Medigo from Crete, who owned the last one, 4,000 volumes. And others from the 17th century accumulated quite large collections. David Oppenheim of Prague acquired 4,500 printed works and 780 manuscripts in the 17th century. And Hyman Joseph Michael of Hamburg owned 860 manuscripts and 5,400 printed books, both know, both collections know in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Other famous collections were the Catholic Priests collection, the collection of Giovanni Bernardo de Rossis in Parma, and later the Solomon Dubno collection in Amsterdam, the Almanzi and Luzzato collections in Italy, the Halberstam collection in Poland, and the Caramoli collection in Brussels. In late 19th century, let us mention the Günzberg collection in St. Petersburg, the Sulzberger collection in the USA, the Steinsteiner collection in Berlin, the Montesinos and the Rosenthaliana in Amsterdam. That will suffice, I hope. I will end this list before approaching Salman Schocken with the Kaufman collection in Hungary and several collections in England, the Elkanata Adler and Moses Gaster collections in London and the Solomon David Sassoon in Lichwood. I will not go on into the 20th century and cause you desperation. I will just mention the fact that several Christian Hebraists, as well as Hasidic rabbinical dynasties, owned important Hebrew manuscripts and print collections in former centuries. Thus, Salman Shokin, his collection was by no means a new phenomenon in the world of Hebrew collecting. The collectors belonged either to the ranks of Christian princes, nobles, rabbis, as well as clergymen, scholars, Jewish or non-Jewish, merchants and businessmen. Salman Shokin was an autodidact. Born in 1877, he attended only four classes. And only at the age of 17 in 1894, he started to study on his own seriously. He purchased books in German and world literature, as well as on economics and philosophy. Only when he became 24 in 1901 in Zwickau, he was able to study and bought books and participated in study groups. From 1907 on, he started to purchase books on Jewish topics, including Hebrew books. He already studied Hebrew before his bar mitzvah, and later on, he took private tutors and developed his Hebrew skills. He commanded the language, although he has not used it in his correspondence. Quite early in his life, he expressed disappointment with assimilatory trends in German Jewry, enjoyed later to the Zionist organization in Germany 
and took part in cult cultural activities inspired by the writing and ideas of Echad Ha'am. According to his recollection, published in his introduction to the first volume of the Mitteilung und des Forschungs Institutes for Hebraische Dichtung in 1933, called Yidiot Machon Ivrit, he started to collect his German and Hebrew collections out of the enduring desire, and I quote him, deep-rooted desire of Jewish people to have at their home well-preserved principal works of the Jewish tradition and literature. I translated it from his German. His collection grew, placing it at its center early and rare prints and in Kunabula. He told that the narrative and the history of the Jewish people, as it is mirrored in the literary output and those early books, was the main goal and the focus of the collector's activity. He wrote that he was attracted by the migration of the books from west to east, the wonder of the types the blocks and the woodcuts from the Iberian Peninsula to North Africa, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire, as well as to the peregrination of the printers from West Germany to Italy and further to the Orient and from Central Europe to Eastern Europe and Poland. He wrote that his desire and coveting for Hebrew books was born when he first read Leopold Zunz Schriften, probably, may I guess, the Literatur der Synagogalen Poesie and his Zogeschichte und Literatur. The publications on Hebrew poetry by Zunz, Leopold Dukes, and Samuel David Luzzato sparked his interest in Hebrew poetry. And by consulting Steinschneider's works, he started to collect his collection. He restored and reassembled unknown prints and manuscripts. His goal was not just to become an owner of cultural riches, but nonetheless to use the collection for future research. We may add here that according to Salman Chokin, even before those years described above, reading a Martin Buber's Die Geschichten der Rabbi Nachman was a turning point in his life. Already in 1914, he wrote to Buber, that several years before reading that book made him again a living Jew. He turned back again to the study of Hebrew and was also contemplating to research Jewish economical activity based on the response literature. Hebrew poetry and Hasidic literature became the central subject of his future collection. In 1914, he became acquainted to Shmuel Yosef Agnon, who for several years, while he lived in Germany, was his close advisor and procurer for his Hebrew collection. In their correspondence published by Emuna Yaron, there is abundant material on those years, and Agron's activity as purveyor of Hebrew books to Schocken's collection. Well paid by Schocken, naturally. In a letter written by Agnon to Salman Schocken in the 31st of June, 1941, which was not included in the published correspondence, but it is available here at 
even at the e exhibition which Danny Hacker, my son, showed me, we can taste and feel the atmosphere that prevailed in the couloirs of the collection. I am reading it in Hebrew not to lose its, its intricacy and delicacy, and we'll try shortly to summarize it later. Halo yadua ma'amar hechacham. Ein chokhmato shel adam maga'at, ela ad kama shesfarav magi'im. Vechen darashu ala pasuk. והיו חייך תלויים לך מנגד, זה הקורא מתוך ספרים שאולים. I hope that no librarian is feeling bad now. <laughs> ואני חפצתי להוסיף חוכמה על חוכמתי הדלה. החילותי עוסק בקניין ספרים. ולתכלית זו נסעתי לפרנקפורט ובאתי אצל כל מוכרי הספרים שם. ופשפשתי בכל חדר וחדר למצוא את הספרים שאני צריך להם. ממש לא הנחתי עלה על עלה בבית מסחרו הגדול של קויפמן. כל אלפי הספרים העבריים היו בידי למראה עיניי, וכן עשיתי אצל שאר כל מוכרי הספרים שבפרנקפורט. עליתי לדיוטה העליונה, ירדתי למרתף. ראשי נמלא אבק ספרים, ידיי זוהמה, בגדיי נפסדו ונתקלקלו, וכך הייתי נוהג בכל יום ויום. I skip, it is long enough. לחם לא אכלתי, אלא מן הפת שבסלי. Very dramatic. ובערב, ולפעמים בחצי הלילה חזרתי לביתי וילקוט מלא ספרים על כתפיי. בבחינת חמור נושא ספרים. אסקיפ אגיין. כך עשיתי כמה שבועות. For weeks. והן כבודו, מיסטר שוקן, יודע כי רוב הספרים העתיקים מעופשים, ריחם נודף, יש שחסר בהם דף או יותר, והייתי צריך לבדוק אחרים, אצטרה, אצטרה, אצטרה. כך נאחזתי בסצבח הטרדות ובחוכמת הביבליוגרפיה ובסודות המדפיסים עד כי שכחתי לאכול לחמי. Well, very dramatic. But telling all this detailed story to Shokin, which was definitely interested, and which, which was part of this endeavor, not just by paying or asking for, but as an active partner in it, shows how much they were closely interested. It was part of their everyday life, not just, you know, being somebody who, who pays for a collection and doesn't use it, or is not part of, of the feelings and all what is done around the collection. Agnon had the talent how to describe it, and how to tell the story. But in fact, this is a common endeavor which Agnon described in his style, and it shows us 
how much feelings were involved in the creation of this collection. Then he goes on and describes his visit in the Hebrew collection of the Library of Frankfurt, his meeting with Aaron Freiman, the head of the Hebrew collection and the famous bibliographer. And thus, we are entering to the in intensive search for the rare Hebrew prints. This intensive search was done by knowledgeable envoys and middlemen. And was held by the decrease or even the collapse of the prizes <coughs> of early printed books as a result of the depression after the First World War. And the aggressive policy of purchase by Schocken, which contributed to the rapid growth of a unique collection. Salman Schocken wrote, I purchased books for high prices by purpose. since I had no time to look for cheap bargains. That's what he wrote to explain why he is ready to pay much higher prices than regular collectors. Here we approach the third field of his interest. Besides the Hebrew poetry and Hasidut, in print and in manuscript, already in 1916, he decided to document Hebrew printing and its history. He concentrated his efforts on systematic acquisition of incunabula and early Hebrew prints from its start till the end of the 17th century, although he paid considerable attention also to periodicals. As the collection grew, he organized it on the basis of scientific criteria using a system developed by him and was in contact with experts in the field. From time to time, he purchased whole collections or parts of collections. Already before the First World War, he bought a great part of the Inconabula collection of Lazarus Goldschmidt in 19, and, in, in, and in 1924, he bought the Moses Marx collection, one of his advisors and purveyors. This collection had 2,500 books, including some 10 in Kunabuls. And in 1926, he bought 270 books owned formerly by Nathan Porges, which included 160 volumes of 16th and 17th century prints, and four in Conabula. In 22nd of January 1927, Salman Shokan expressed his wish to bequeath his in Conabula collection, collection to the Hebrew to the Hebrew National and University Library. It was sent there in 1931. At that point, the collection had 72 items in 64 editions, most from Italy, and according to the, li the list of Habermann, 15 were from the Iberian Peninsula. 58 of them were shipped to Jerusalem in 1931. Meanwhile, he continued to collect 
in Konabula for his collection, a very nationalist situation that many collectors did. As soon as they got rid of their collection, they started a new collection. Uh, he started it already in 1937. He amassed a considerable new private one, collection of Inconabula. A list made at the Schocken Library in 1963, there were 48 in Kunabula, three non-Hebrew, 25 complete copies in his second collection, I mean, 11 copies missing some pages, and 12 fragments. Out of them, five printed on parchment, and 13 very rare prints from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind, the Inconabula, both Inconabula collections of the Schocken collection were the gem of the collection. In order to place this data in context, let me remind you that Hebrew in Kunabula constitute only a tiny part of the large number of printed books in Europe in the 15th century. Their total number doesn't exceed 150 editions according to most experts. Therefore, there are less than a half percent of printed editions in the 15th century, which may are more than 3,000. According to Audrey Offenberg, nowadays there are about 2,000 copies of Inconabula in public collections, either whole copies or partial ones, or fragments, 1,200 in Europe, 500 almost in, US, in the US and Canada, over 200 in Israel, and five in Australia. Since you will have a special presentation on his in collabora treasure at the National Library, I will not go into further details on this issue. But what about other Hebrew prints and manuscripts in the collection? In an estimated list of the library from March 1970, the following is stated. Out of almost 300 manuscripts, most of them not very early, 80 were liturgy and poetry, 67 Kabbalah, and ethics, 18 halakha, 13 Bible, 14 Hasidut, and 12, 21 Varya. The collection of the printed books were as follows, and I mean, I mean only the early printed ones. 125 between 1500 to 1520, 270 between 1521 to 1550, 500 from 1550 to 1600, 261 from 1600 to 1650, and 210 from the latest part of the 17th century. Altogether, 1,370 copies, some of them unique and several very rare editions. The collection included some very rare and important manuscripts like the Nuremberg Mahzor or the Nuremberg Haggadah. But undoubtedly, the most important manuscript is Shoken 37, not just in my opinion, but in most opinions, including 
Salman Shokin's opinion too, which is a manuscript of Hebrew poems. Salman Shokin brought it from the book dealer Jacob Halpern from Vienna for the huge sum of 28,500 Reichsmarks. Unbelievably high uh, price in 1928 already. It is a 17th century copy of more than 3,000 poems of the Iberian and Oriental medieval Jewish poets, including the Diwans of Solomon ibn Gabirol, Yehuda Halevi, and Moses ibn Ezra, and others. The only such complete Diwans. This manuscript was, according to Salman Shokin, the major drive for the establishing the institution of research of Hebrew poetry in the 1930s in Berlin. And when it was transferred to Jerusalem in November 1933, 16,000 photocopies of poetical manuscript pages made in European collections were also sent to Jerusalem and are here in this library. At the end of 1933, Salman Shokan left Germany, but he was not able for obvious reasons to liquidate his business and sell his property. Between 34 and 39, he managed to salvage his collection almost intact and transferred it to Jerusalem. Already in August 33, he deposited part of his documents, books, and art in a storage company in Marienbad in Czechoslovakia. In November 1933, the Institution of Hebrew Poetry and its books was moved to Jerusalem. And on the 21st of October 1935, his Hebrew collection left Hamburg for its way to Haifa, where it arrived on the 1st of December 1935. Later, other shipments were sent during 36, 37, January 38, the library of Karl Wolfskal, etc., etc. At the end of 36, the Shokan Library was inaugurated in Jerusalem, this, this building, this collection. Already in 1934, Salman Shokan told Aaron Freiman, I quote, the Shokan Bibliothek soll eine Ergänzung der Großen Nationalbibliothek sein. That's what he told. Already in 34. This became true, especially during the period of 1948 to 1960, before the building of the NUL in Givatram. And for several scholars, even later. But Salman Shokin was not just confined to the salvage of his collection from Nazi Germany. Even after leaving Germany during his long negotiations with the Stadt und Universität Bibliothek in Frankfurt through book dealers from 34 to 37, he was able to get in exchange for a Dirmstein manuscripts, nine Hebrew incunable editions. And for the manuscript Ein Deutsch Theologia, 
20 editions of rare prints from the 60 Hebrew rare prints from the 16th century prints in Frankfurt. That collection was destroyed during the war, not the Incunabula, but the rare Hebrew books were destroyed during the war. One of those ones, the first print of Eni Yaakov, Salonika 1516, printed on vellum, owned formerly by the Beta Levi Portuguese family of Salonika, I was fortunate to use before it was sold in my work on that dynasty. What kind of a collector was Salman Shokan? There is no doubt that after he established his collection, soon after the Elkan Adler sold collection in 1923, and the Moses Garster sold collection in 1925, Collections sold to, to public institutions and the confiscation of the Baron David Günzburg collection by the Russian state in 1917. His library became probably the most important private Hebrew library in the world in the 20th century. Its importance was mainly in its printed editions, not in the manuscript collection. But nonetheless, its holdings of poetry and liturgy, Kabbalah and Hasidut, both in print and manuscript, is still extremely important nowadays. For certain topics, like the Breslov Hasidism, the collection at Chokin is unique and phenomenal, as it was shown lately at an exhibition at this place. Salman Chokin was not a regular collector. He was a person who often read items of his collection, especially books of thought and ethics. He was not fond with Jewish law and casuistic. It is very evident from the items missing from his collection. Several times he contemplated to do research on certain fields and publish studies, but it never materialized. Even his programs to publish catalogs of the collection never materialized. Probably, maybe, as a result of his perfectionism. Instead, he developed, beside his consuming business activities, into collecting and publishing activities. Those activities show his fine taste for aesthetic prints and the humanist outlook. He might have been a frustrated, self-made intellectual beside an extremely talented businessman. In a letter, again, to Agnon, from the 31st of October, 47, quite late in his lifetime, he wrote, again in Hebrew, Chaviva, it is translated by Imuna Yaron into Hebrew, from German. Chaviva alai shura achat shel tarbut emet mikol mishlach yadai. Unbelievable. A man with such achievements in his business, and his worldly activity and so great a talent, writing such a sentence. True culture, even one line of true culture 
counts for me more than all that activity. Ilu hayiti yachol laasot leman sifrutenu leman terbutenu. Could I do for our literature and culture? Hayiti roeli kavod she'en lemal mimenu. That would have honored me more than anything else. Lo she'ani mevakesh gedula lets me. Not that I look for any greatness and honor. Or she'ani rotze lasim atzmi mitzanat. Well, he was not a mitzanat. Unbelievable. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, uh, gave a lot to writers and to public institutions. But he says, no, that's not my wish. I want only to support, to help the cultural uh, activity or whatever. In a way, he was very similar to great collectors of the Renaissance, of the Italian Renaissance in the 16th century. People like Pinelli of Padua, Podiani of Perugia, or Ulisse Androvandi, who were promoters of the Respublica Literaria, but not writers themselves, although they are, were very talented persons. He was probably born in the wrong century, but at least he was spared from the digital age. Thank you very much for your patience.